Okay. Well, yeah. So, hi, I'm David. Um, this is about CGIRC, um, in particular, a retrospective of um, the past essentially 18 years. Um, so, first of all, I'll just go through what actually CGIRC is, and then a little bit on history, um, and then sort of some more technical details on how it works, and maybe there are better options these days. Um, so, CGI, what's CGI? Um, these days you don't actually come across it very often, but it's a specification for a web browser as a way of running a program that a um, web server can then understand what it returns and return something to the user, um, which means it's got a set of environment variables that are specified, um, various other conventions as to how, how things run. Um, so the nice thing about it is the web server does a lot of the work for you, so you just drop a program in a directory and We'll get to how that kind of makes CGIRC very easy to set up. Um, colon. So this, this is one of my regrets for CGIRC. The actual name of it is not that. It's one colon, which is a little confusing because um, in Perl module terms, when you write a module in Perl, you use two colons as a separator. And some people have sort of misinterpreted what the name of it is. So um, in hindsight, that was a not the greatest name. So, not that. Um, IRC, I think everyone here knows what IRC is, hopefully, but um, something that I'm kind of proud of is the first entrance that some people had to IRC was using CGIRC. Um, like, when I was at university, I met people in the computer room using it, and I was like, hi, uh, awkward student at the time. Um, I wrote that, and they're like, what? <laughs> um, that, was, that was one of those fun experiences you get occasionally in your life, and you remember. Um, but also, yeah, I'd like to sort of think about um, the history of things and how, th how that sort of relates. <laughs> so, I initially wrote CGIRC because um, I was at school. Um, there was a very restrictive firewall. I'm fairly sure you're familiar with those. Um, you couldn't really do anything other than plain HTTP. Um, and in those days, actually, SSL wasn't very common, so it was all unencrypted um, HTTP. Um, so, you know, one way to do IRC was uh, like some weird way of tunneling SS over SSH and stuff, but that was a bit unreliable. So um, there were some other web-based IRC things. Um, it was fairly common to have Java-based things, which I'll get onto in a bit. Um, but also, there was one other uh, program called Whiplash, which was... Um, very similar to CGIRC, but uh, didn't have quite as many features as eventually um, I wrote. And also, it wasn't free software in that it had a very interesting license that restricted some of the things you could do with it. Um, so I sort of took it on myself to write, write something. Um, I'm not entirely proud of the code because, um, you know, this was, I was at school still. Um, I kind of learned Perl along the way. Um, and yeah. So this is a bit random, but um, timelines. So this was in last night in a burrito place up the road. Um, they had a timeline, and I kind of enjoyed this because in 1988, when IRC was invented, it says on there, which you can't read, I'm sorry, but it says that uh, CDs overtook vinyl in terms of the, um, the their sales. And then also in 2001, um, when essentially I first wrote CGIRC, um, actually, it's nearly 18 years old. I, um, I was looking back on the actual files, and the date that I found was about October 2000 as the first, um, the first date that I actually wrote some code for it and still have like an archive with, with date stamps on. Um, but yeah, in 2001, the iPod was announced and Wikipedia was launched, so that's sort of casting your mind back, that's that's what the, the world was like. And I also just really liked this because they stuck a spectrum to the wall. Um, like yeah, um, it's in Mission Burrito up the road if you want to go and see a spectrum. I'm sure there are other better pl places to see that, but just in case. So anyway, um, here's a little timeline which I made. So IRC was created in 1988. Um, and then about 2001, as I said, I'm 
can't exactly date it, but around 2001 was the first version of CGISC. Um, so that's that's what, um, depending how you look at it, 12 or 13 years. Um, we're now in 2018, so scary to think, but CGISC has been around for longer than IRC was when I first wrote it, which is like one of those sort of, okay, we've lots has happened in the world. Um, and something else that um, I did in 2004 was contribute a couple of chapters to a O'Reilly book called IRC Hacks. Um, and that kind of was when I realized that actually people were taking this seriously and there was sort of interesting things going on and um, maybe I had more users than I realized. Um, it's kind of hard to know open source software sometimes, like if it just works, people don't actually talk to you that much and it's like, okay, sure. Um, so anyway, that's that. Um, right. So at the time, Java was um, what people would assume this was. Um, and when people first saw CGIC, they were like, that's interesting, but is that not Java? Is that going to make my browser really slow and stuff? And you have to remember at this time, um, Gmail didn't exist. Gmail was released in 2004 and was one of the first sort of widely known examples of a very responsive web app. Um, so in a way, the uh, CGIC kind of predated that. Um, so just sort of go back as, as to how this works. Um, it's not Java. Um, you've it uses frames, which at the time was kind of a way of doing this that was easy. So imagine you have two frames. Um, so th this is a little bit different because actually there's three frames here because it's a, a user list on the side. But um, if you ignore the, the users on the side, the the main content frame there is essentially the, the thing at the top, and then the little text entry area at the bottom is where the um, input frame is. So how, how, how things work to start with was there was no JavaScript involved. This wasn't using JavaScript. It was literally keeping a connection open and just printing the lines as they appeared um, to the user. So um, as, as someone says something on IRC, it was just pushing uh, more text over the HTTP connection um, and because it was using frames, that meant that you could have the one frame at the top that was um, displaying the text, and then the input could go through the frame at the bottom. Um, so the, the interesting thing about this is um, it actually works in, uh, this is links. Um, I haven't actually recreated that uh, recently, but that I, I think that screenshot was about 2002 based on the, uh, the dates in it and stuff. Um, so that was kind of crazy. It's like, okay, I wrote a web-based IRC client, and now actually you can use it as a text-based IRC client. That's not quite what I had in mind, but um, just sort of to prove that it's not actually using JavaScript, um, that that was possible. I don't actually know if it works on current versions. Uh, we'll get to that maybe. Um, but then that, that was kind of the, the first versions. Then something called Comet came along. Um, it's actually a bit more complicated than that. I, uh, this, this sort of, was not given the name at the time. The, the name Comet was invented in about 2006. Um, the Wikipedia article linked there explains the exact uh, timelines. But essentially this is, rather than doing what I mentioned of pushing data in a frame and just showing the user one thing, you actually push JavaScript events or some, some event-based um, data to the, to the browser and then do something, usually using JavaScript, um, at the time, this was often called sort of dynamic HTML, um, kind of Ajax these days. Some people call the, the resulting sort of mix of technologies. Um, there are kind of lots of different names depending who you ask as to exactly how you name this thing. Um, but the, the interesting thing here is this is really working around how the browser is doing things. It's not really um, actually making use of a particular technology. It's building on the technologies the browser has. And to give you an idea of how kind of awful this was, um, in Opera, there was a weird bug where if you essentially sent a script tag, it wouldn't actually do anything until it's, it got about another kilobyte of data or something. So still in CGIC, there's code that if you're using Opera, probably not relevant anymore because they changed their browser engine and stuff. But if you were using Opera, it would essentially add a one kilobyte HTML comment after every line because that meant that it would actually display the text uh, faster rather than having to wait for more text to appear. So 
um, it's not the most reliable um, thing. So, but it's amazing that it does actually work. So, um, so here's the new version of CGIC, and new was about 2002 at the time. Um, and so you'll notice here along the top, there's a status uh, tab and a hash CGIC. So this, this can't be back here, like here, this was just printing text. You can't do that just by printing text because you've now got two bits of text. So you have to use JavaScript or something to swap over the what's in the current view. So it actually has a, the data in memory in JavaScript and then dynamically changes what you see when you click on things. So this is becoming more of a proper web application, which these days you kind of take for granted. It's like very common to have JavaScript doing things like that in your browser. But at the time it was like, wow, this actually like feels like I've written a proper application and it, that was that was quite interesting. Um, so how this actually works, um, this is kind of an example that is um, edited for the sake of trying to explain it. So rather than having a frame like we had before, um, imagine that hidden somewhere, it doesn't really matter, there's an iframe. So if you're not familiar, an iframe is just a way of putting essentially a little box on a page and that can pull in content from somewhere else. In this case, the, the content is actually hidden. It's just um, hidden through like CSS or somehow it's basically z zero by zero. So the user doesn't see anything, but it can still load data. So it's loading data um, on the fly. And then you can see there's a script function here called send, which imagine it does something more than document write. Like I explained, there's, there's actually multiple virtual windows and stuff going on there. but it does something simple that outputs the text to the user. So then when, when that frame is actually loaded, what it does is something a bit like this. Um, does that, oh that's more visible at that, okay. So um, yeah, it, it calls parent.send. So parent in this case is inside that iframe, the parent of it is the page that loaded the iframe, which then means that essentially it can keep a connection open, just print out script tags, and call a function on the fly. And at this point, you have essentially a one-way channel that just keeps itself open. Um, so that obviously can then print out more and more script tags and just carries on showing stuff to the user. Um, so this is a nice quote I like. Those who learn history are doomed to repeat it. Sorry, those who do not learn history <laughs> are doomed to repeat it. Um, George Satanaya, I believe is who this is attributed to, although there's some question as to exactly who um, that came from, which says something about how accurate history is. But um, the, the interesting thing here is this is an awful hack. Like, whoops. Um, you know, it's, it works. Like I said, it has to have wor workarounds for certain browsers and stuff. Um, these days, we have something called WebSockets. Um, and this is now browsers supporting a bi-directional way of sending data back and forth. It's not just um, sending data back, as I was explaining there, and actually what happens in CGIC is there's a separate post request that is sent to when you actually type stuff. Um, so WebSockets um, are browser-supported and provide a bi-directional channel. Um, there are some downsides because they're using the HTTP um, port, but there are, are different protocols. Some proxies and things intercept them. Um, so actually there are things that people have built that are similar to WebSockets that use JavaScript to essentially provide a nice API to the developer that means that they're underneath they're doing maybe something a bit like that script tag or something else that's browser specific that works. Um, and so Kiwi IRC has a component that is the Web IRC gateway, which essentially means as a user of their product, you don't have to care about this. You can run a Web IRC gateway and it's a small component written in Go that runs on the server side that proxies between a IRC server and a WebSocket gateway or various other technologies, like I mentioned, that do something to avoid needing to deal with proxies that can't do WebSockets. Um, so in theory, this is used by Kiwi IRC, but you can also use this yourself if you wanted to write something a bit like CGIRC. Um, you could write a, your own UI and then use the back end of that, which abstracts away the WebSocket details for you. Um, so a few more things to talk about. Um, so C CGI has some problems. Um, in particular, 
as I was sort of explaining and getting to, there's a long-running connection here. That means that the long-running connection is also running a process on the server side. And each process you're running is using up memory, using up resources. And also it means that when the user like disconnects, um, that, that process dies and all their state goes away, which um, is kind of kind of awkward because it means that they can't actually like easily reconnect um, if, if they, these days it's common that people are on a mobile connection, but they have to re-log in entirely if something goes wrong. Um, so CGI isn't a great model. Um, so here's, here's a, I don't know, yeah, okay, that's just about visible. Um, this is a PS output from a web server. Um, so mphirc.cgi is the, the streaming thing that I mentioned that's pushing the data back to the user. So it's the main, it's the main code behind CGIRC, essentially. Um, you can see here that one of those processes is using about 12 megabytes of memory. So each user of your server who's using uh, CGIRC would be using about 12 megabytes, which these days is not really a problem. But you can imagine when I wrote this in 2000 or so, um, that really didn't scale. Um, ended up having quite large servers just to support quite a small number of users. So using a model where you have a long-running process like the Kiwi IRC gateway or something else where you've got not CGI, essentially, um, is much better. Um, so that's one of the reasons that I really wouldn't recommend you use CGIC anymore, because there are much better options. Um, the other fun one is security. And this is a little bit embarrassing. But as I said, um, I wrote this at school, essentially, and later university. But um, there have been two issues, which were basically actually the same issue discovered uh, six years apart um, in different components of the program. And both were XSS things. So there's a parameter that CGIC uses to keep track of who the user is. Um, it needs to know when you submit the form that I mentioned that you type the data in um, what, what, who you are. Um, and it just creates a random identifier for the user um, on the fly. And in two cases, uh, it didn't escape that when it printed out the HTML again. So you could put a script tag in there. Um, and the interesting thing about this is one of the times that someone discovered this, it was actually running on Mozilla.org. And because Mozilla have a bug bounty program, um, they actually paid out on their bug bounty program on my behalf. So I kind of felt bad about that, making Mozilla spend money for a, <laughs> a very silly mistake. Um, but then the other thing is security-related um, abuse. So luckily, uh, there haven't been too many issues, but the default install restricts you to a single IRC server and a single channel so that when you set it up, actually, you're not letting people connect anywhere in the world. And because of how CGIC is connecting from the server, it appears as your server's host name. And then maybe you'd get banned from IRC networks or something if, if people abused it. So the default setup is you just actually want to let people use a single um, channel. So it just, it just does that. Um, the, the IP address and username, what that means is at least for IPv4, you can encode an IP address in a hexadecimal format that's short enough to fit in an IRC username, um, which means that the username part is then actually the IP address of the user. So if you ban the username, you actually ban that user's IP address. Um, obviously, there's some downsides there in that networks that do host masking and stuff, if you don't turn that off, you then actually reveal the user's IP address accidentally if you don't realize. Um, so yeah. Um, and then a, f a couple of other features that got added. So there's, there's quite a few features you can see that are basically about stopping people of using this. Um, it can check a DNS blacklist when you connect. So drone VL being um, a common example of that. Um, don't yeah, don't allow uh, compromised proxies, for example, to connect. And then uh, a final thing is it has a little login secret, which means that um, there were people who were basically just running against other people's servers just a lot of get the um, like the URL for mphirc.cgi connecting many times and then essentially joining channels with lots of users. Um, and it just makes sure that you actually have gone through the login form rather than um, just like running a wget or something lots of times to, to try and connect. Um, where are we? And OK, so the related to the what I was saying about IP address and username, that's not great. So there's a 
command called WebIRC, which um, is now actually part of the um, IRC v3 um, specifications. I don't think it's been fully approved yet, but it's definitely in use by a lot of people. Um, so if the server that you're connecting to supports this and you've got an agreement with them that they, they will trust you to um, provide the host name of the user, then you can configure um, CGIC and Keyword RC and various other um, things support this um, to provide the host name that the user is connecting with and then the server gets to do all the stuff it would normally do um, when it checks a connection, which means that CGIC then doesn't have to re-implement all the features the server has for anti-abuse. Um, so that's, that's the link there to the um, specifications of WebIRC. Um, so that's, that's kind of all I had. Um, how am I doing for time? Okay. Um, so I think overall it has been a successful open source project, and but I do sort of say has there because really what I'm trying to say here is there was good stuff, but these days much better options. Um, but on the other hand, CGI scripts are so easy to set up, and I know people who just have dropped this in like a directory on a web server and just use it very occasionally. You don't have to run any complicated infrastructure. If you've already got a web server running, it just works. Um, it's helped many people get on IRC, so I think that's good in general. Um, and the web IRC command is now supported by many servers and many clients as well, as I mentioned. Um, that's kind of all I had. So if there are any questions or anything else, and contact details are at the bottom. Uh, you said that it was using printing script tags to the page to send from server to client. How does it do the other way? Um, so from the other way around, it, it basically just uses a form, um, just a normal post. And what it actually does is on the server side, it, it listens. When you, when you connect to IRC, it listens on a local Unix domain socket, which is the, the R parameter I mentioned. Um, that's actually the name of that socket in a directory in slash TMP. And the, the form then just submits to that um, and sends it over to the main process. So essentially, the main process is always the thing in, in control, and the, the other stuff just sends it to that. No? OK. Thank you very much.